I wanted to just, again, we'll briefly try to touch on uh, something. And, I, and I, I think I'm going to continue on with this. I was planning on a continuation of this into next Sunday anyway. So I'm going to just kind of get a, see if we can get the plane off the runway anyway here this morning. So you have to come back next week. Um, but I want, to, I want to talk about something that we prayed into during our, our week of prayer and fasting a few weeks ago, and that is becoming a people who walk in love. A people who walk in love. And that, that this is so critical for the days ahead that we're, we're going into. If you do not know that you know that you know that you are loved by the Father, and that love has had such a tremendous impact in in changing your very identity and your security and your value, your worth, you are going to have a difficult time loving people. And we've been called to love our enemies. How many of you signed up for that one? And yet, the scripture has called us to love even our enemies. Now, we saw that as we were um, taking communion together this morning, reading out of 1 Peter, that we've been called to follow in the steps of Jesus, who, though he was reviled, he did not revile back. Though he was mistreated, he did not react back in the same way toward them, but actually laid down his life and took the sins of the whole world upon himself. And we're called to live that way, and that is the walk of love. A lot of people have attempted to try and to love their neighbor as themselves. They've attempted to try to love their enemies and to develop a, a lifestyle of, of love because they, they have an understanding that's what we're supposed to do as followers of Jesus. Um, and yet they find themselves struggling greatly in relationships. The relationships still are, are challenging, and there, there's people that they run into that they just like, man, I just have a hard time loving this one. And, uh, and part of the reason for that is we're called to love our neighbor as we love ourselves. But I've discovered that loving ourselves uh, doesn't happen automatically because uh, there's something that has to happen in us from another source that will cause us to be healed so that we can then love ourselves the way we have been loved and freely have received. Now you can freely give. It's very difficult to give away what you don't have. Very difficult to operate from who you have not yet become. And so the first step in learning to walk in love so that we have the power of being able to touch the world, even when the world may hate us and, you know, and, you know persecution of, of followers of Jesus, of, of Christians, is, is ramping up in our nation right now and over the whole world. So many people are being martyred for their faith, and, um, and there's... The possibility for you to have some persecution coming your way and even some suffering is, is greatly increased. Being an American is not going to protect you from some of the things that are going to come upon believers in the days ahead. And, uh, and if the scripture is accurate where it says people are going to go from bad to worse, guess what's going to happen in your neighborhood? And it's your workplace. You're going to find yourself in situations where things that you've never seen before, behaviors in people that you have never encountered before, as, as, as the love of many grows cold, as Jesus said in the last days, you're going to be running into a lot of things that are going to uh, challenge you greatly in your relationships with people. And so it's imperative that we dive in to a source of something that's been given to us by the Holy Spirit like never before. The number one thing that God always intended to have happen to us is being loved. 
the number one thing that God has called us to walk in is love. And the most powerful force in the world to touch other people is love. We have a winning combination in Jesus. I want us to look at 1 John 4, and then I, want to, I just want to touch on uh, some things that um, will hopefully help our understanding in this whole thing. So we're going to, we're going to start with 1 John 4, 7. Beloved, say that, that's your name right there, beloved. That means you are one who is loved. So I want you to speak that over yourself. I am beloved. Now tell the person next to you, so are you. We got to get this identity. I am my beloved's, and he is mine. His banner over me is love. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God. And knows God. Now that tells me right there, one is, we are, in God's view, and in his family, we are those who are loved. Not with just any love, but the most supreme love, and that is the love of the Father. And, and we all, through Jesus now, and what he did on the cross for us, and having uh, made us sons and daughters, we are in the family, and we are those who are loved. And so John says, since you are loved, and that is your very identity as one who is loved by the Father, one who is in the family of his love, we ought to love one another. It's part of the family likeness. So how many know we've all been called to do this? No exceptions. Well, God, you, you don't know that person that's in my life right now. Even them? Yes, even them. Let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. What does that tell us? That tells us that if you are one who has learned how to love, it is the evidence that you have been born of the very DNA of God. It is the evidence that you, have, you are a new creation, that you have received new life in Him. You've been, you've been born of God. Therefore, you, have, you don't just have access to love, but God who is love is also, that is part of your nature now. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Now, flip that thing around. Everyone who is born of God has now been brought into this whole environment, this whole culture of the love of the Father and of His family. You've been born into that, and having been born into it, you now can begin to know God in a way that you didn't know Him before, didn't even have the possibility to know Him. See, here's, here's part of what happened. I'm going to just dive in right here. In the book of Genesis, we have the whole story of what has been called the fall of man. And uh, there's, there's just enough detail there to try and give us a picture of, of one of the most uh, significant things that happened to mankind, aside from Jesus coming and to, to save mankind. And that is that in the garden we see Adam and Eve, two people who have been created 
in the image of God, created by God himself, and God formed them from the dust of the earth in his likeness, breathed into them the very breath of life. So whose breath do they have? Did he just blow oxygen into them? No, he breathed life into them. Because in God is life. How many of you know that apart from him, there actually is no life? The scripture tells us that everything that is alive in the earth right now is sustained by Jesus himself. He is the author of life. And he holds all things together. There is no life apart from God. And that's why God said to Adam and Eve, in the day that you say no to me, in the day that you believe that you can operate apart from me, in the day that you think you have the right to run your own life, you will surely experience something called the end of life. Yeah. Separation came when Adam and Eve, through the deception of the serpent, when they said no to God. When, and, and it's not even that they said no to God, although God told them, don't ever eat of the fruit of this tree. You can eat of everything else in the garden, but don't, don't touch this. They made a decision that there was a knowledge higher than what God had spoken to them, and they were deceived into believing that if they ate of the fruit of that tree, they would receive something that would empower them so that they could create their own reality. They would know something about right from wrong. They would be able to uh, define their futures, they themselves could become their own gods. And they fell for it. Didn't want to pass up that offer. But the problem is, is that even though they were deceived, they still, in that deception, said no to God and yes to themselves. When they did that, what they didn't realize that they were going to do is they were going to, in saying no to God, they were going to bring a break, a breach, in their relationship with the Father. And it was a relationship, and this, this is, we often don't fully grasp this, that in that garden there was a relationship with the Father where there was no pain, there was no fear, there was no experience of love being withheld from them, there was no manipulation, no control, no rejection. Can you imagine living life without ever having had the experience of rejection? They'd never known that. They never knew what insecurity was. They were continually secure in the love of the Father because he was loving them perfectly. Unconditional. You really should spend some time just trying to meditate on what it was like for them to live in that experience where love is never pulled away. And that being loved is never contingent on how you behave or how well you do something or how much you accomplish. God didn't put him in the garden and said, now be fruitful and multiply, and then I'll give you lots of reward and a lot of hugs and kisses. But boy, I tell you, if you don't, you know, meet the quota, you don't extend my rule and reign out a little bit, you know, a few more miles out here, you're going to get a spike, and I'm going to send you to your cave. Or whatever. 
They never knew what it was like to have the threat of something being pulled away from them because they just walked with the Father. All they knew was His face, His presence. God is love. There was no separation, no barrier. You and I, that's all we've ever known. There's a separation, a veil between, a break. So they never knew insecurity. They never knew inferiority. They, they, they didn't even have to think about their value. They just are. I'm, I'm his beloved. I just am his kid. There's no measurement. There's no comparison. They don't even have to compare themselves to one another. You're getting more love than I am. No. None of those things that completely control our culture and the whole world was part of their world. They had absolute freedom and absolute access to the Father. And they were able to be in such perfect relationship with one another that they didn't even know the experience of being naked. No experience of being exposed. There was no shame. There's no guilt. Because everything is centered in just being born of God and being in the family and knowing Him and walking with Him. I want to tell you, this is what we are created for. God did not create us for sin. He didn't create us for brokenness. He didn't create, it, create us and place us on this earth and, or, and create this planet for what you and I have been walking through our entire life days on this planet. He created us for love. But that's all you would ever know. That would be your consciousness and your subconsciousness. Just, I am His. He loves me. But when that moment came where they said, no, we can run our lives better than God. That that separation came, not by the will of the Father at all, but by the power they had themselves to make a choice to say, I will live apart from God's authority in my life. And when they did that, they stepped into a whole world that they thought they could control. And what they found out is that now they had to control one another. Now somebody else had the power to define me according to who they are and what they think about me. Insecurity comes. Inferiority comes. Because now there's the comparison. Now they're seeing me through somebody else's eyes instead of seeing me through the Father's eyes. All this fear comes in. And pain. Because when you are affected by somebody else's selfish choice, whether they intended to do it or not, whether it was deliberate or not, when you're impacted by somebody else's selfish choice and you yourself are not fully loved and know who you are, you are so vulnerable and pain through somebody else's selfish choice. Being undervalued in the way somebody treats you. Being pushed aside. Having somebody steal something from you. Having somebody just decide that they don't like you and push you away. All of these things, the, the reality of pain comes into my life. And with the awareness of pain, 
pain in the heart. Sometimes even pain in the body. I developed something else called fear. Because I don't want that pain to be repeated. And I become aware of who is able to bring pain into my life. And the breakdown begins. And so after this happened, God had to begin to help them to relate to one another. The whole Bible, if you want to put it in a nutshell, you can, you can put it this way. The whole Bible is all about what God has had to try to do to bring us back to the place where Adam and Eve were in the garden. And teach us how to live as those who are loved. And not controlled by pain and fear. See, when you when you have pain and then you have fear, you start realizing, hey, you know, there, there's that reality that love can be withheld from me. And many of us here in the room have experienced that. Probably the most of us have had multiple experiences, even with our own parents, where we were not perfectly loved. And there were moments of pain, and there were moments of insecurity, and, and feelings of rejection, and and um, and we had that moment whenever it came in our lives where we realized, "I am so vulnerable to not being loved and being hurt." And I have these two big gods in my life called mom and dad, and they have absolute power to define me. They have the power to protect me and provide for me and want me and hold me and care for me and show affection to me. To believe in me. And they have the power to not do that. Now what's a little boy or a little girl is supposed to do when mom and dad use their power to not love on any given day. Maybe they're just having a bad day themselves. Maybe it's because they weren't loved very well either by their parents, and, and so they don't know how to give it to their own kids. Or whatever the scenario has been in your life, there are those moments where we become acutely aware. That little boy, that little girl becomes acutely aware that love is an iffy proposition in my life. And the thing that I need more than anything else, and that is to know that I am wanted, that I am valuable, that I matter, and that I'm going to be cared for and protected when that awareness starts getting shaken, my world starts to get shaken with, with these experiences that are painful and scary. We start asking the question, how do I get love? And we spend the rest of our lives trying to figure out the system how to minimize pain and get as much love as possible to make the pain go away, to make the fear go away. And in that, Satan has had so much power to just set bait in front of us and take us all kinds of directions, just trying to deal with the pain and the fear. And we get into this thing called performance. We finally figure it out. When I do well, when I meet your expectation, when I'm beautiful enough for you, or beautiful enough in the world's eyes, when I, when I accomplish enough, when I meet your standard, when I make you happy, 
then I'll be loved. And we step onto a treadmill. Some have called it the gerbil cage. Where you get into the endless running of how to stay ahead of the pain by performing the problems that doesn't work. A little bit of love here, a little bit of love there. Somebody believed in me. Somebody applauded for me. Somebody said they wanted to marry me. I would chase it after the love that was so desperate in me. The answer you will never find in a human relationship. And you will never find it in the world. There is nothing that Satan can offer you. In fact, Satan, in his intelligence, he knew how to set us up in this dribble cave where we would live apart from the Father so that we would struggle to ever believe that in God there would be enough love for me, that he, he loves me unconditionally. That we, we, would, we would have a hard time with him because we had a hard time with other people in our lives, especially mom and dad. And he knew that we'd also have a hard time with each other. And so fear enters into the relationship and mistrust, all those things between us and, and our creator and between us and one another. What's the answer? Memorize your Bible. Be perfect. <laughs> Give all your money. Earn, perform, earn, perform. Somehow you'll get there. And in the middle of the cries of humanity, God says, there's only one answer. They have to be brought back into the family. But the problem is, is that in humanity, is there's, there's this big no in our hearts. One of the things that I, I love about John's song that he sang here at the end is, you took the no out of my soul forever. Now all that's left is all my yes forever. That no and that yes don't come through willpower to become a good person. It comes through getting reconnected to the love of the Father. Being born of the Father, born of his love. We could never get our way back into that garden and say, okay, God, we want to, we want to you know, hit the reset button. Can we do this one again? No, because all, all the pain and the fear and the working of sin in our lives that just get passed on through the generations, we all end up with this, this disease. There's only one answer. I have to be born again. I have to be brought into the Father's family, born of God himself, who is love. And I have to, through being brought into his family and now receiving his very nature by his spirit, I can now begin to know my Papa God again. And what John says here is everyone who loves, the reason why they are able to and even have a desire to love other people is because they've been born into the family. And they have come to know their papa and his son.
This is the evidence. Let's read just a little further. The one who does not love does not know God. For God is love. What John is telling us here is there is, there is an experience of knowing God where you can actually know this love that will set you free and redefine you. God himself is love. He's not just a loving person. He's not, he doesn't just have love. He is love. His very essence, what motivates him in everything that he does, is love. What if I can be brought back into relationship with the Father? where that separation, that break has been removed because Jesus, the Son, who came with a perfect yes to the Father, was then able to take all of our no into his body on that tree and satisfy the wrath that we deserve for all of our no and to reset us back into the family. But it goes further than that. He doesn't just forgive you. He also then takes you and places you into the very family of God. He puts you in the spirit of God. The spirit of God who also is love. Carries the whole culture of heaven is now in you. The door has been swung open. Access to our Papa is wide open. No barrier. And you even get the very nature of God himself in you. Love makes sense to you now. The capacity to receive that love, to be restored to that perfect love, is now with you. And pain and fear, and the need for control, and the need to perform, gets chopped right at the roots. And I don't have to live that way anymore if I don't want to. Because I am his beloved. I am his son, his daughter. I have been born of him who is love. I have his nature in me, which is love. I have access to the very heart of the Father, to know that heart, to hear his voice, to receive his embrace without fear, because in him there is no rejection. In him there is no inferiority. And John goes on to talk about how that perfect love, as that love is perfected in you and me, as we just keep embracing, we just keep coming to the Father, we keep believing and knowing this love that he has given to us and this family that we've come into, that it begins to be perfected, that love is just working and redefining everything in me. You see, you and I have no idea how we have been defined in every part of our, our being by other people, by the system of the world, by a love that's always been conditional. We have been defined. We have been manipulated and controlled by these things for so long that when we come to the Father and His love, it's very difficult to switch gears. We have a tendency to expect it's going to be the same way. No matter how much somebody tells you, God loves you. He has a wonderful plan for your life. And you say, hallelujah. But no matter how much you hear that, 
no matter how much you read it, something's got to get redefined in you. And it doesn't come through just reading it or hearing it. It comes through knowing and receiving and believing this love and letting it work its way into every layer of your life where things that you used to be afraid of, you realize, oh, I don't have to be afraid of that anymore. He loves me. I could give you lots of different examples, but we let that love work its way through day after day, circumstance after circumstance, fear upon fear. And we realize, oh, but he loves me. Oh, but he loves me. Oh, he loves me. And if he loves me, then this is true. Then this is going to happen. That every single thing in our life, our past, our present, our future, it's all being defined now by a love that never ends, never fails, never gives up, never runs out on me. And the church has been trying to run with a Christianity without being rooted and grounded in this love. And what they've produced is a lot of performance. And when you're busy trying to do all the right things the right way to perform for God, you're doing it out of fear. And it becomes contaminated. Some people say it becomes religion. Actually, what it means is you just become hard to live with. Nobody wants to be around somebody else who's performing. I've learned that. If I'm busy performing, it's because I'm afraid. I'm afraid of more pain, and so I'm performing. And that means I need you to meet my agenda and making me feel good about me. So don't get in my way. I'm performing. I'm earning. Don't you mess it up. We don't, we don't want to be around people who are afraid and need to control. But how wonderful it is for the church to finally come into a realization and experience and expectation of a love that cannot be taken from you. We get our minds renewed, we get our expectations renewed. And every experience of that love that just keeps coming and coming, whether I deserve it or not, whether I perform well or not, whether you like me or not, whatever, it just keeps coming. And that love keeps telling me who I really am and what I'm really worth. And eventually I start figuring some things out and I start losing fear. And when I lose my fear, then I lose the need to control. I don't have to control God, and I don't have to control you. I just get to control me, which is a good thing. And this is what God is bringing the church into today. Because God doesn't want to take the greatest things that he has for these last days and put it into the hands of orphan-hearted people who are afraid and are performing because they're just, going, they're just going to take the best that God has and use it to try to prove that they're worth loving. They're going to use it. My ministry. My prophecy. My 
healing, my, all these things that I do, my knowledge of the scriptures, come and be taught of me. We, we come to the church and we, we learn the system in the church. We start looking around and we say, how can I increase my value here so that people will love me? How can I look important? How can I just flash a little of me out there so people go, ooh, I want to hang out with you. We know how to do that without even thinking about it. Does that help the church? No. You know what that produces? Competition, jealousy, ambition, and every kind of competitive yuck. And then people get just as hurt or more hurt in the church than they did before they got here. Very hard for the prodigals to come home to that. That's the older brother. But God wants us to get free in his love. But it begins with understanding that when I was born again, I was born again because of the love of the Father that reached out and found me. John says we love him because he first loved us, not the other way around. God didn't start loving you and me because he's, he saw us loving him. He knew there was no hope for that. You know what, you know what God's greatest hope for him being loved is? By putting his son who loves him inside of us. God does not trust you and I to be able to love him. But he does trust the Son and the Spirit. And that's what it means to be born again. If any man be in Christ, he become a new creation. And if any man receive the Spirit of God, he is of God now. And it's the Spirit of God in you that cries out, Abba, Father. There is no Abba in you and I in our flesh. But the Spirit, if we give place to the Spirit, we give place to this love that the Spirit is leading us into, oh, this Abba Father comes out of you, and there's a connection with the Lord, and you realize, oh, this is the most amazing possibility that has ever come upon my life, to be loved. And then eventually you start realizing that how the Father sees you and how he treats you and what he says about you and what he believes about you, all of that, oh, I could, I could see myself that way. I could love myself that way. And it's not a narcissistic love. It's just me loving myself according to who the Father says that I am. It's the truth. And you walk in that sense of, well, this is who I am. This is who the Papa says that I am. And you love who he says that you are. And you're able to just throw off all those labels and all those rejections and all those things that people, you know, in the way they didn't value you and didn't treat you right and they stole from you or whatever. You're able to just toss those things aside and say, no, I know the truth about me. I know what the Father has for me. And you begin to step into a freedom where you start losing that consciousness of what other people think about you. And it's so wonderful to not be naked. God had to say to Abraham, or to Adam and Eve, who told you you were naked? Do you know that nobody told them they were naked? They just discovered that all on their own. And when you're on your own, you live with nakedness. 
But when you're with the Father, that all just disappears. And his love covers a multitude of sins. Mm. So next week, I'm going to try to take us further into this. Let's stand, and I just want to lead us in a prayer here. Now, I don't know if you can tell I'm setting you up. Not manipulating. Just trying to lead you. One of the reasons that Jesus was sent in human flesh was to show us what it looks like to be perfectly secure in the love of the Father and have, have that kind of relationship with our God again. To see the possibility of what we could be and what we could have. And in that is such a huge yes towards God. I mean, do do you understand that the more you say yes to God, the better things are going to go for you? (laughs) The more yes we have, the more everything is going to work. So, Lord, we come before you right now. Just We understand that we need this love. And I believe that you're here today, Lord, in, even as in, through taking communion and, and healings and, and all that we've been doing here, you are inviting us to step closer, to know and believe this love that we have received through you. And Lord, we would want to say this morning, I want to be defined by this love. I want to walk as one who's been born of love. And I know his love. And Lord, I want to begin a journey with you of being taken so deeply into your love that it transforms not everything, not only everything inside of me, but also all my relationships. That I can love other people the way you love me. Could you just give God permission to bring a transformation into your heart? Well, I want to be transformed by your love. I want to be defined by your love. I want to learn this love. I want to be totally immersed to the point that your love casts out all my fear. And I become one mighty in the earth because of my ability to love other people the way you love. I just want you to to just get a vision right now of you going into the future. No matter what comes your way, no matter who steps in front of you to create an issue for you, that you have full ability and desire to love them. I want you to get a vision of the power of you loving them regardless of how they're treating you and how that love flowing through you could actually transform them. Lord, bring me into this love. Bring me into this love.